We've all heard the music to Disney's famous It's a Small World ride. It's impossible to forget, It's a Small World is just one of the many theme park rides that have their own musical soundtracks. Disney has been producing special music for their theme parks for years, and many smaller parks in Europe have also begun to invest in music for their rides and roller coasters too. Why do certain theme park rides have their own music, how is it produced, and why can't I get It's a Small World out of my head? Before even considering building a theme park, the Disney company was already producing soundtracks for their own animated films. When it came to Disneyland, it made sense to create bespoke pieces of music for the rides at the park. At the most fundamental level, music makes us feel certain emotions. For example, a movie might use sad music to make us feel emotional and upset during specific scenes. Theme parks use music to the same effect, but instead of making us feel sad, they invoke other emotions. A particularly scary ride might try to frighten guests further through ominous and eerie music playing inside the attraction. Through the use of audio, rides can create atmospheres specific to a themed area or even build tension moments before visitors board the attraction. Music got more and more important over the last years, as did the, uh, the whole theming, uh, the whole visual theming as well. Uh, it became more and more important for theme parks to create an overall experience which touches every sense. So music and sound design also, uh, with creating sound atmospheres, is a good way to uh, add another layer of theming to an attraction. That's Zeva Villibrand, the managing director of Imascore, one of the leading companies within the attraction audio experience industry. They've provided ride soundtracks for some of the world's biggest regional theme parks, such as Europa Park, Kings Island and Alton Towers. The success of the highly themed immersive attractions at Disney and Universal Parks has led many other smaller theme parks to explore theming their own rides. Over the past few decades, regional theme parks in Europe have increasingly been using storytelling to engross guests in their attractions, with music being a key part of that process. By making an attraction more immersive, parks can set themselves apart from one another. Each ride, and therefore each piece of music, is completely unique in order to tailor the guest experience and transport riders into a world of fantasy. Visitors can journey through space, witness pirates wreaking havoc, or in the case of It's a Small World, take a whimsical voyage to witness various countries and cultures from around the world. Some rides take this further through onboard audio, where a soundtrack is played directly from the ride vehicles. Some roller coasters feature speakers embedded into the trains of the attraction, allowing for ride audio to be heard consistently throughout the entire experience. By doing this, theme park designers can build storyline elements directly into the soundtrack of the ride, or even change the tempo and speed of the music depending on how fast guests are traveling at that particular moment. For example, the soundtrack of Disneyland's Space Mountain builds up tension and anticipation while guests climb the lift hill. Once the ride actually begins, the pace of the soundtrack increases in line with the ride's faster pace. Not all rides have soundtracks, however. Nick Hudson, an independent creator of audio for theme parks, sums it up perfectly. I think it all comes down to the difference between theme parks and amusement parks. Often, the words theme park and amusement park are used interchangeably, but that shouldn't be the case. An amusement park will build a roller coaster on a bare plot of land, whilst the theme park would build a roller coaster themed to a specific story. Amusement parks are often all about the thrill about the rides themselves, whereas theme parks aim to immerse guests in the details of the ride through the use of theming and storylines. In the case of audio, amusement parks often play pop music throughout the various ride areas, whilst theme parks have bespoke soundtracks specific to that attraction. You'll often find that theme parks use music not just on rides, but throughout the entire park too. They want to keep guests immersed from the moment they enter. Apart from just having unique, immersive music, there are other benefits for a park choosing to produce their own soundtracks too. If they were to go down the route of original music, you generally do a one-off cost, and then they own it, and they can do whatever the heck they want with it. You don't have to deal with who owns what, and who needs to be paid when, and stuff. So, in a way, it makes it easier for parts to manage the music financially, but it also means they are free to put it in adverts and TV, and it becomes a real brand identity. Brand identity can really help to enhance the impact a theme park makes on its guests, both inside and outside of the park itself. 
A fantastic example of this is Alton Towers, one of the UK's biggest theme parks. Alton Towers have become known for using In the Hall of the Mountain King as their main musical melody. They use it for everything, from TV advertisements to the first thing guests hear as they enter through the gates. The motif has also been worked into the soundtracks of most of the attractions at the park, further cementing the association between the theme park and the melody. This not only provides a sense of consistency across various rides within the park, but makes the brand recognisable outside of the park too. Now, for some people, when they hear In the Hall of the Mountain King, they instantly think Alton Towers. I do it. For a soundtrack to add to the experience, theme park designers have to consider the emotions they want guests to feel. As a result, the audio has to be designed in conjunction with the theme and storyline of the ride itself. The production of theme park music or theme park audio in general uh, usually starts with a few nice words and, and artworks we receive from uh, the, the creatives of the several attractions. Once the theme park has chosen who will produce their audio, the collaborative process can begin. The first task is for composers to create a demo track, a short, rough piece of music that aims to summarize the sounds, sensations and melody the finished track might offer. To be successful, the theme park's creative team must effectively convey their ideas for the ride or area they are creating to the producers of the audio. There are certain kind of buzzwords that get chucked around a lot, sort of industrial, gritty, Victorian. I mean, you wouldn't associate high, happy woodwinds with a creepy gothic mansion, would you? So if I know what the maze or the attraction or the area looks like, I know immediately where to go musically. We need cliché sounds in order for the brain to immediately relate to what the story is. Haunted house rides are fantastic examples of cliché music, like Jewel at Alton Towers. After only a few seconds, our minds have already associated this music with a creepy theme. The dramatic organ, the whiny notes of the violin and the slow tempo help our minds relate to the haunted house style of the attraction. Apart from communicating buzzwords, theme parks might actually invite the producers of the audio on site to the development of the new ride. Here, the creatives will try their best to convey the stories and emotions they want their guests to experience. At this point, the project enters its most critical phase, the creation of an identifiable hook or tune. On It's a Small World, the repetitive, joyful and obvious tune draws us in, and it works. But an in-your-face melody isn't always the best choice. Many rides have more subtle tunes, which seamlessly blend into the designed area or attraction while still featuring a recognizable hook. Until you find the right sound, mood and especially main melody, the main tune, this is all just the beginning. The production comes afterwards and you're just putting the additional minutes behind this approved two or three minutes, which really have everything in them you need for the soundtrack. The demo track has to be perfect before they can begin to build the full length track. Theme parks and the respective audio teams will go through numerous versions of the track with both parties bouncing ideas back and forth until it fulfills the creative's vision. Sometimes it's not that easy, especially when uh, the soundtrack is quite special because it's, it's a special style or it needs um, to be special in a, in a different way like it was on the Smiler. In 2013, Alton Towers debuted a new roller coaster, the Smiler. It features a musical score created by Imascore, which has become one of the company's most recognizable soundtracks. The Smiler has been themed to a device which manipulates riders into smiling and is the creation of an evil organization named the Ministry of Joy. The roller coaster soundtrack was designed to emulate the repetitive and annoying nature of It's a Small World in a much more sinister and dark way. The recognizable melody makes guests feel uncomfortable as if they're slowly going crazy. Though, for Imascore, this initially felt counterintuitive. 
the creatives at Merlin Entertainment really needed to, to push us to the point where we understood that it should be repetitive, that it should be annoying in a way. Uh, that was something that we really don't want to hear, we don't want to do, but it was good in the end. Normally, theme park music should blend with the rest of the attraction to become part of the overall experience, not instead be its own obvious and very individual thing. For the Smiler to truly get under the skin of guests, the music had to be in the foreground, it had to be everywhere. But the audio for each ride will have a very different brief and purpose depending on the design of the attraction itself. Once the initial melody has been chosen and the theme park's creatives are happy, the bulk of the soundtrack can be produced as an extension of the main tune. As theme park audio is played continuously in the background, composers must create tracks that flow without a traditional beginning, middle or end. It also normally can't be too repetitive while still weaving in and out of the main melody. Audio producers achieve this by creating unique layers of sound, each one designed piece by piece. We have two kinds of composers uh, in our team. Some of them are just, yeah, we call them clickers. They are just using their mouse to, to put all the little MIDI notes together for the several instruments. Um, but we also have a lot of composers working with their MIDI keyboards. They're just, yeah, on this keyboard playing each instrument they like to have in their arrangement, which makes it often a little bit more natural. It's like painting a picture, so you have one color and then you just lay the color on top of the other color. It's doing what's called an arrangement window. Uh, some projects can get up to 200 stems of audio and it can get very complicated because you can't remember where that flute was that you need to edit. The creation of audio is an intricate and complex process which often means progress can be relatively slow. Composers can produce anywhere from just 10 seconds to 5 minutes worth of audio per day depending on how inspired they are at the time. This means that producing audio for theme parks can be a lengthy process. Between the initial back and forth discussion of the park's creatives and the composer, to the final production of the full length track, the audio can take weeks, months or even years to produce. Once the initial full track is complete, it's sent over to the park's creative team for further comments and potential changes which can lead to more drafts of the score. After these have been addressed, the final soundtrack is handed over to the park for implementation and the job of the composer is finished. Or is it? The audience is always the final part of, ev of any collaborative process because they will tell you what works and what doesn't work. I'm always interested to go to attractions and just stand back and watch how people react. From the reactions of guests, parks will quickly be able to tell whether their immersive experience, along with the soundtrack, have had the intended effect. Music belongs to theme parks. When you enter a theme park, you want to hear this entrance music. You want to get in this positive, happy mood. You don't want to walk in silence. All the time we visit the theme parks without music, you really feel like something is missing. And that's why I think that music is crucial for theme parks, especially for the entrance areas. When you buy your ticket, you enter the park, you walk your first meters into the park, you really want to get in the mood. You want to have a good day and music helps you to do so. Ultimately, audio is a core component of the theme park experience. Not only can music help to establish the identity of a theme park, but it can also enhance how guests experience the park itself. Audio is crucial for building immersion and excitement, both of which give a park or ride the opportunity to establish a unique and original experience for guests. People visit theme parks to have fun and get away from their everyday lives. Music transports guests into another reality, one where they're on a dramatic adventure, in space, or visiting the world's many countries. So, why can't we get It's a Small World out of our heads? Well, Disney designed it that way on purpose. It's the perfect concoction. Short, repetitive and simple, all of which makes it easy to remember. The song also uses the same chords over and over, with different melodies between the verses and the chorus. We end up absorbing more of the song without it feeling as repetitive. Though, if you do find yourself with It's a Small World stuck in your head, I recommend listening to I'm a School's full excerpt of the Smiler soundtrack. It is truly something else. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you all next time.